Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. And to this day, we're out of debt, right? So um, you telemarketers that are listening to me, don't try to get a hold of me, all right? The other would be to watch out for timeshares. There's always the value, and you've got to run it through the whole economic plan of your family and your future and what it is and how you're going to use it, but be careful of these things. So the idea is just build sales resistance. Learn to say no. In fact, what would be a lot of fun for you to do is to you and your family, if you have a particular need, something you like, why don't you just say, we're not going to get it yet, but why don't we ask God to bring it to us if he wants us to have this? And be real quiet and watch the Lord bring it into your life. See if something happens or that that item goes down in price. All right, number three, save it versus hoard it. Save it versus hoard it. You know what hoarding is. I'm sure you've seen some of these TV shows. You wonder how these people can actually exist, but they do. There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. And I really believe that. It's not because they're rich. You know, rich people can have a lot of money, but if it goes out very quickly, they're very poor. So again, they manage it. They have it in the dwelling of the, of the wise because they kept it. They didn't spend it. So their treasure is with them. Then it says, but a foolish man swallows it up. And of course, you know what happens when you eat something. And I'll stop there. Let's go on. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. I love this. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Let's stop and look up here for just a moment if you can. It seems like it's just this verse taken out of another context and slapped into this little context of Scripture. And it's kind of cool that it's there because we really love that verse. You know, blessed is the man, you know, who follows his commandments. You know, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. All right. But if you realize, there's a very important truth there. God's word is to be obeyed no matter the cost. And there's always a, a, a byproduct of obeying him. You know, the inner joy, he gets the glory. I get all of that, but there's a lot of other stuff that comes along when we obey his word in our, every part of his word. We don't cherry pick his word or do the easy things. We, we, do, we do the whole word at that particular time. We get all of that. But now where is this passage of scripture in? It's in a context that actually deals with wealth and money. So when you hear me on Sunday speaking so much on this money thing, some of you say, I'm up to here with all of that stuff. When is he going to get off that broken thing, you know, and get onto something else? Well, I will. Don't, don't worry. I'll, I'll get there. But at the same time, though, your pastors, your preachers, they have to teach you this. This is such a key part of our life. And so then look, go on to the next part of the verse. It says this, wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. How precious that is when you save it, when you have it there. Now, you're saying, what do you mean about the hoarding part? Can't you move over from the saving to the hoarding? The answer is, is, is in this. I'm not a psychologist and all of that. I can only best imagine that the people who do hoard, a lot of times they do that is because they feel like, I need this. What happens if I have a need and I don't have what this is, so I need to have it now for a future need, so they're grabbing more. Maybe, maybe this will be gone. Maybe that'll be gone. And they, 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 they keep all of this stuff because they don't want to have a horrible life later on if they didn't have it. So they want to accumulate as much as they have because they have the fear of not having it when they need it now or fear of not having it in the future. That's generally the case of a hoarder. And there's probably a lot of other psychological things that are, are kind of blown up in their mind, but basically it's that. Now let's take it to a Christian level now. The Christian level would be more like this. You know, I got to have all of this because I'll need it for the future, and there's always that the case. And I, I need to have it now because later on it won't be here. It's on sale now. And so we're okay with that. As long as within all of that, and here's where it takes deep honesty, self-awareness. Am I doing all of this because I have forgotten that God can provide for me just as much in the future as he can right now? Am I, have I, am I fearing the future instead of having faith in the God of the future. Now, did you catch all of that? Now, watch what I'm going to do now, if you can see this. I have a balance up here. Everything has got to be in balance in Scripture. You can't take just one verse without properly. We call this systematic theology. You have all the doctrines, but then you have to have the doctrines to connect with one another. So yes, you do have to take care of the future, but make sure that nowhere within you 
is the fear that God won't take care of you in the future. That's one side of it. The other side of it is are those who are saying, just let go, let God, don't worry about it. God will take care of it. Spend all my money now. I've got a car payment at the end of the month. Somehow he'll get it to us. You can't do that. You've got to save for that as well. So the bottom line is your heart again. That's what I'm preaching so much on is your heart. Is your heart and is deceitful above all things. And that's why you've got to meditate in Scripture. Listen to this stuff. Read it through. Own it in your heart. So that when you're confronted with this, you will say for the rainy day that it talks about. Talks about the ant. Go to the ant, you sluggards, how he collects all of this stuff. All right? I gotta see all of that. But he's not hoarding it because he fears he's doing that because that's what ants do. Christians do it, so they are prepared for hurricanes and things like that, but not so much because God won't be there. He will be there when you can't do the things that are right. And that's why this verse says there's wealth in the dwellings of those that have money. Okay, they might not always show it, but it's there. Let's go to number four. The fourth, you want to avoid co-signing, all right? Avoid co-signing. I want to share with you, a, I want to share with you a, a heartache of a family that I'm aware of. Um, the son wanted to buy a car, so he went to the father and said, I really can't afford it. I got this much money, and this is the car I'd like to get, and I don't have that money, but Dad, would you co-sign for that car? And the dad wisely said, you know, I would love to do this for you, son, and I'll do everything I can to help you get that car. But right now, I can't co-sign for you because for me and my conscience, I just, I just can't do that. I, I just don't think it's biblical for me to co-sign for that car. Well, that was the end of that discussion. The relationship wasn't broken, but the son was not a wise son. The son decided to go to another family member, as they often do. Uh, and they went to the other family member, and the other family member was his uncle, that they liked very, very much, and they had a good relationship. So he says, I can't afford the car. Dad won't get it for me. He won't sign. Would you co-sign for me on this? And the uncle said, oh, sure. If he can't do it, I'll do it for you. The dad never said he couldn't. He just couldn't do it because of principle, not because he didn't have the money or he didn't like the kid. So he went ahead and co-signed it. The son picked up that car after co-signing with the uncle. It was in two days. He wrecked the car, flipped it over on its top, and now the uncle had to continue paying for the car. Now, can we get by all of that? But you have to go into now the family drama that goes with all of that. And I'm going to end that story, but to let you know that when we do begin to violate on some of these issues of striking hands with others, I think in context it's not so much about the co-signing as much as it is, this guy can't pay it, but you're going to help him so he can pay it. So in a sense, you're paying it for him but now he owes you the money. Let's take you through this scripture. It says this, Do not be among those, in Proverbs 22, who give pledges or promises or contracts among those who become guarantors for debtors or debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? In other words, you have to then give up something that you have yourself to give to them. Now, I'm going to give you a number of verses, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them to you, but I want you to go through them very carefully. Write these down. Proverbs is loaded with this whole concept of not signing for someone else. All right, Proverbs 6, verses 1 through 5. Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. Proverbs 16, verse 15. Proverbs 16, verse 15. Proverbs 17, verse 18. Proverbs 17, verse 18. Now, let me give you a couple of thoughts as you perhaps either have done this one passage of Scripture says that if you've done this, try to, try to get out of that contract as fast as you can, like a doe would, running. So try to get, don't, don't do something unbiblical, don't break a promise that you made, but as soon as you can, get out of that co-signing, that agreement as fast as you can. Another principle says, all right, if you're in all of this, then realize that if that person that you get you signed with gets disciplined, you will be disciplined with them. If God chooses to discipline that person because of other things going on in their life, and you're hooked into that, that means some of that discipline can spill upon you as well. One more. If you are loaning, but the idea of signing with that person, knowing that the person is going to give back to you, and they can't give it back to them, then don't loan it. Don't co-sign if you can't afford to do it. So when you are giving, the bottom line, I'm going to give you the real bottom line, is when you loan or cosign, don't expect ever to get it back. And so you give it to that person as a loan, and you could sign it and do all that that you want. But if you don't get it back, watch it, here it is. If you don't get it back, it does not hinder your relationship with that person because you went into it with your eyes wide open. Did you catch that? 
to give it or loan it without the thought of getting it back. And if you do get it back, thank the Lord for it. So the caution is, if you want to get out of debt and stay out of debt, be very careful about the co-signing in partnerships. Number five, manage it properly. This is kind of like the umbrella over all these principles, manage it properly. But this is a neat passage. All right, you're the head of household now, and I know this is looking like we're way back in the Bible days with flocks and herds and sheep and all this stuff. But I just want you to think that all that that they had was their way of providing for the basic needs of their family, all right? So they did it by way of, um, you know, farming and ranching and things like that. So it says, know well the condition of your flocks. And when I read that, it says, all right, know the condition of your investments. Know the condition of that which God has given to you. Know that because there's a purpose. Your flock, your investment, your money, your resources, the hard assets, the liquid assets, know the condition of them. So you can't just leave them. You've got to focus on them. Then it says, and pay attention to your herds. doesn't mean worship your herds. It doesn't mean that you abandon your family for your herds, but realize your herds and your flocks have a purpose that's more than just having uh, sheep and goats. It says, for riches are not forever. So in other words, be very careful. You may have something now, but it may not last. So take care of that which will have long-lasting results in a positive way. Nor does a crown endure to all generations. You might have a, a wonderful job right now with a high uh, uh, salary and a lot of perks and a nice title, that crown, that, that job, that crown, that position of influence that you have, however it is, whatever it is, will not endure to all generations. It could change at any moment. There are people that are listening to me right now that went to work on a Monday and they packed up their desk Monday night and they had to go. There are those that the business downsized. When the grass disappears, the new growth is seen and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in. So in other words, we're looking for every little bit that we possibly can to gather what's out there. So it may not be a big thing, it'll be a lot of little things. The lambs will be for your clothing. So that's why you take care of your flocks. You'll need your flocks to provide clothing. You're going to need your money. You're going to need your job. You're going to need your um, education that you're getting because eventually it'll be your clothing, a basic need in life. And the goats will bring the price of a field. Hmm, now you'll have that goat so that you can now buy more property to put more goats on it so you have more of an investment and advance what you need because you never know how long you'll have a job. Then it says, and there will be goat's milk enough for your food. So now I have clothing and food going back to Matthew chapter 6. For the food of who? Your household. That's your immediate household. And also sustenance for your maidens. And we could say slaves. I, I hope this is not going beyond you. I have no slaves, okay? Carol has one. I'm joking. But the point still being is this. I do have slaves. You know what my slave is? It's my car. It works for me. My tools, they work for me. My computer, it works for me. These are my slaves. So I need to take care of those things that will make life easier for me to do the things to provide for more slaves or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So that's why we have to take care of what we have and manage it. So it's not just about money. It's about all those things that, that puts the whole economy of our money together to do what God wants us to do, bring glory to Him, take care of our family, and reach others for the Lord. All right, manage it properly. Three words in your margin next to it. You want to put the word, it requires a budget, it requires record-keeping, and it requires prioritizing your spending. It requires a budget, and my budget is, I uh, don't have enough money. Okay, that's the end of my budget. Start over again next month. No, that's not it. It's a budget, then it requires record-keeping, and then it requires prioritizing your spending. Now, for those of you that are really techie, there are a lot of good software programs out there that will help you to, to, to write up a budget to help you then to record what you have into that budget that you have so you can look at it. What the software does not have, are you ready for this? No software ever designed by humans includes the discipline to use it. So what we have to do is we have to learn the software, and then we have to follow it, and you're going to say, boy, does that take time. It does take time. But at the end of the day, maybe the month, maybe the year, and for some of you, the end of the decade, you will be debt-free. It does work. Now, let me tell you, I am, I'm not smart enough to use the software that's out there. I have a hard time figuring it. You may think I can do these computer stuff. I struggle with it. So I have an old-fashioned Walmart ledger that I got about 30 years ago. And in it, I have our budget. And when I get paid, I put it all in a savings account, and I spend some of that savings into a checking account that I have. But I don't live out of the checkbook. I don't live so much out of the savings. I live out of this ledger right here. This tells me what I have. So when I get paid, 
Money is put away for a car. It's put away for our health medical that we might have. It's put away for um, a vacation. So they're all in here, and then I know what I have, and then at the end of every month, I, I we call it uh, justify the bank statements, and then I look at what I have here to see what I have for now and then in the future that we have here. Now, does it take discipline? Yes. Do I have a lot of discipline? No. But I've lived enough years to know the pain of not being disciplined, and I hate that more than having the pain of being disciplined to be able to do this. Did you catch that? So that's the whole idea of managing it. And now I end with number six, and you'll love this one. Look for the very best buy. You know, <laughs> These convenience stores, that's how they make their money. It's because it's a convenience store. Who's it convenient for? You know, it's convenient for you and, and your debtors. Okay, but it says here, she considers a field. That means scrutinizes this field, considers it. Think about all the concept of considering something, a field. And then she goes out and she purchases it. My question is, how did she purchase it unless she already had money? I know, you. well, she could, she could, she could have borrowed it. Yeah, yeah, she could have. I, I, could, I can open a window to that, but I don't think that's where it's going. A field and buys it. From her earnings now, she plants a vineyard. And then you can kind of figure out what's a vineyard for. It's going to grow a lot of stuff. What are you going to do? You're going to take the vineyard, you're going to drink it, whether it's olives or whether it's, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, wine or whatever. You're going to do, then you're going to sell it and give it to others. My point is simply this she didn't plant a tree, she didn't plant a plant, she planted a vineyard because she had enough earnings to buy what she needed to get the field and to get what she needed to put in the field so it's not just a field of weeds, all right? So she had all of that. So that tells me she was a, a wonderful woman of, of insight and thoughtfulness. And I don't think she woke up as a six-year-old and had it. I don't think as a 16-year-old or a 26-year-old, somewhere along the line, she might have had some pension for that. But the bottom line was she still had to be surrounding herself with people that help her to figure this out so she would do it right at this stage in her life. Now, that's a long way to simply say that's why you're here every Sunday. You're learning these things so that maybe later on you can then do what you need to do, again, to bring glory to the Lord by managing your money to take care of your basic family needs and then to help others with it. So let me give you some action steps and we'll go home. <clears throat> I will develop a balance of godly ambition and contentment. Put a check by that one if that's something that you're going to develop in your life, in your heart, and I do believe it would be helpful if you had a, uh, we could call it an accountability partner. I, I, that sounds like a policeman to me. But um, it might be a study buddy, a prayer partner. I think your best accountability person ought to be your mate. Watch this now. Listen carefully. Your mate is your best accountability person if you have a good relationship with your mate. If you don't, it can be um, disastrous. So the issue is, I don't have a good relationship with my mate, so I'm going to go to somebody else. Well, that's better if it's the right person than not having one. But I'm going to tell you, you need to go back to square one and develop a better relationship with your mate. And you young people that listen to me, it'd be with your mom and dad and with your kids downward. Number two, I will accept my recent financial situation, wherever you are right now, as an opportunity to balance trust in God with diligent labor. So in other words, I, I would be as if I called you up to the altar and you just surrendered to the Lord and says, okay, I'm accepting where I am, but now what I'm going to do is I am going to trust God, but I'm going to work hard at the same time. Number three, I will make the necessary adjustments in my lifestyle with God's grace to become financially free. And now number four. Before I go over number four with you, I, I want you to hear where I'm coming from. I came up with these answers here by a survey I, I did by interviewing Christians who were full on for God, that, got out, that were in debt, they got out of debt, and now they're staying out of debt. And I, I asked them basically, what are the practical things you did to get out of debt and stay out of debt? And I went just to Christians. Now, I'm, I'm giving you just, I'm giving you the kind of the, the, the surface response. The root issues were much deeper. A surrendered life, we confessed sin, we, we worshiped on Sunday together, we got involved in ministry, those kind of things. That's all, that's all the, the, the foundation. But after we got off the foundation of their godliness, here are the practical things that they did. And I want to submit these to you. Here's what they said. I will pay each bill the day that it comes in. Now, generally, we pay it at the end of the month. I get that. Sometimes, sometimes it's taken out of your account. I get all of that. But for them, they felt they needed to pay the bill as soon as it came in. It didn't get lost in a pile of stuff on a desk. Number two, I will refuse to use credit, debit, or ATM cards. Now, remember, they did major surgery to get out of debt. 
All right, number three, I will say no thank you to every unsolicited salesperson, whether it's on the telephone, on the computer, or at the mall, or at a flea market, or a garage sale. Unsolicited person. Number four, doesn't mean they didn't go these places. They just said no when that person was unsolicited. When they went to a salesperson, they went already, uh, how can I say, uh, armored up when they went. Next, I will never go shopping anywhere without a list of necessary items to purchase at the best price. In other words, they didn't just go to the mall. I'm bored. Let's go to the mall. Some people are wired that if they don't get something when they go to a place to buy something, that they had a failed, wasted day. Uh, that's an end of that. I'm going to move on now. <laughs> yeah. All right, Carol, we better run to the car. Okay, let's go on. I will continue. I will contribute 10% of my income to my personal savings and investment account. In other words, they paid themselves to save it. All right. We next. I will never co-sign for anyone, and finally, I will develop a budget with the help of my mate and possibly a godly financial planner. I will look for the best price after I prayed for the Lord to provide it first. And then finally, I'll be faithful in giving to the Lord first a generous portion of my income. So they never held back their giving. In fact, the majority of them said that even when they had debt, they still gave to the Lord first. And then when I asked them why, and they said, well, we just feel like that's what we need to do so that God will continue to help us to pay off our debt. And then with a twinkle in their eye, and I don't know if this is motivated with the proper motive, but they said, because we knew that when we gave to God, He'd always give us more than when we gave to Him, and that would give us more to pay off our debt. Isn't that cute? I'm done today. I think we have enough for all of us to work on, and the, and the Pons family is with you on this journey. And I am so excited that the Lord has given us such a plethora of biblical principles, and with all of that, He's given us the power source to be able to do that. And even then, when we can't make it up, He's given us a boatload of grace to help us through all of this. Why? Because He wants us to take these resources, bring glory to Him, take care of the needs of our family, and reach others for the kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to make sure that you don't just get bogged down in money and resources. I know that was the biggest part of our talk, but all of that is attached to a very loving, sovereign, omnipotent, and I might say generous, heavenly, benevolent Father who loves you. And those of you that are redirecting some of your life now to get more in balance with Him and wanting to do these things, your goal isn't to get out of debt. Your goal is to glorify God. When you put Him first because you love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love others, your family, and others, I'm going to tell you that that begins to really become something special in you. Those of you who are guests that are listening to this, you can be completely debt-free with your finances And then when you die, you'll spend eternity separated from God. And God says, no, I love you. I want you to be in my forever family. And don't come to me with promises of starting this or stopping that or continuing this or continuing that. The Lord basically says, just believe on me. Basically, he's saying, just wherever you are, whatever you've done, whatever kind of person you are, whoever you are, if you would just trust in me as the one who died and rose again. Not behave, not believe and behave, not even believe, but believe in him. Jesus says, believe in me. You'll have everlasting life. And yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's in the future. You're going to go to heaven, but you get an everlasting life now. But with it, you get this. Catch this now. Listen carefully. You get everlasting life. Now that life you get, I believe, the the heartbeat of that life is you get everlasting Jesus because He is life. And man, when you have Him, you have everything. But you've got to trust Him as your Savior because He is the Lord who died in rose. Father, we love You and I pray that if there's anyone here that's listening to me that has not trusted You as Savior, oh Lord, love on them. Let them see Your goodness, but also help them not to uh, get distracted by other things so they can focus totally and only on you. Father, for those that have known you as Savior now and are wanting now to um, look at their resources and look at it now through your eyes and say, thank you, Lord, for everything you've given to me. And Lord, even stuff that I got that you didn't give to me, but I wanted and I took it. I didn't keep it from my eyes. I, I, I bought it. And now, Lord, I want to rethink. I want to take inventory first in my heart, then in my house, then in my business. I want to be all right before you. 
Thank you, Lord. We worship and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.